Welcome to another E64 Showcase. E64 is a computer software designed to help fathers obey God's command in Ephesians 6.4 to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. And now, let's watch one of the instructional films that come with the E64 software library, which you can purchase from the online store at e6-4.com. His name was Lieutenant John Blanford, fresh from military duty in New Guinea. In six minutes, John was to meet the woman who had filled such a special place in his life for the past 13 months, the woman he had never seen, yet whose words had sustained him unfailingly. Blanford remembered one day in particular the worst of the fighting when he and the other two survivors of his army scouting unit were caught in between a pocket of enemy dugouts. In one of his letters, he had confessed to her that he often felt fear, and only a few days before this battle, he had received her answer. Of course you fear. All brave men do. Next time you doubt yourself, I want you to hear my voice reciting to you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. He had remembered, and it had renewed his strength. His mind went back to the book he had read in training camp. Throughout the book were notes in a woman's writing. He had never believed that a woman could see into a man's heart so tenderly, so understandingly. Her name was on the back cover, Kate Greenwell. From a New York City telephone book, he found her address. He had written, she had answered. The next day he was shipped out, but they had gone on writing. For 13 months, he faithfully wrote and she faithfully replied. When his letters did not arrive, she wrote anyway, and now he believed he loved her, and she loved him. But she had refused all his pleas to send him her photograph, she had explained. If your feeling for me has any reality, what I look like won't matter. Suppose I'm beautiful. I'd always be haunted by the feelings that you had been taking a chance on just that. And that kind of love would disgust me. Suppose I'm plain, and you must admit this is more likely, then I'd always fear that you were only going on writing because you were lonely and had no one else. No, don't ask for my picture. When you come to New York, you shall see me, and then you may make your decision. We will meet at the train station, she wrote. I will wear a red rose. Going my way, soldier? Lieutenant John Blanford, you must be Kate Greenwell. I'm so glad I could get to meet you. May, may I take you to dinner? I don't know anything about this, honestly. That young lady in the brown suit, she fed me the breakfast rose on my shirt. And she told me that if you asked me to go out with you, I should tell you that she's waiting for you in that restaurant across the street.
The film you just watched is one of the hundreds of films that are a part of the E64 Educational Library. E64 is a computerized curriculum that combines video instruction, text-based instruction, music, computerized testing, competitions, games, and more to create a unique tool for learning. Just a few of the ways that E64 is being used around the world include a homeschool curriculum for parents who want to give their children a strong biblical worldview education, a Christian school curriculum for learning to read, math, science, history, and Bible studies, a family integrated Sunday school curriculum for churches that are moving towards a more biblical family integrated model, a tool for fathers to do family worship in their homes, and a tool for church leaders to train their men to be strong spiritual leaders in their homes. The E64 library is currently over 35 gigabytes of instructional material and can be purchased on a handy flash drive by going to the website at e6-4.com. Give us a call if you would like for someone to come to your church, homeschool group, business, or other organization to do a live demonstration of the software. If you are a strong supporter of Christian education, then you may want to consider becoming an E64 distributor. We can provide you with the tools and training to start your own home business as an education consultant. Ephesians 6.4 commands fathers to bring their children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. For fathers who want to obey this command, there's no better tool than E64. Here's another E64 snapshot from the Homeschool Channel with Captain Brett of the Homeschool Advantage. 1 Peter chapter 4 tells us to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality has become a lost art in America, and yet it is both commanded in Scripture and is a key element in each of the biblical lists of qualifications for a church elder. In the E64 lesson titled Wisdom's Gate, being salt and light families, Israel Wayne demonstrates that the most important way children can be salt and light in their communities is by helping their parents offer hospitality in their home. To learn more, watch the E64 video titled Wisdom's Gate, Being Salt and Light Families. Watch E64 lesson videos online at thehomeschoolchannel.tv. Are you looking for a family integrated church that follows the regulations for worship found in 1 Corinthians? Then come and worship with the Fellowship of the Father. We don't have programs that divide families, rather families worship together and our elders make themselves available to disciple men in how to become strong spiritual leaders in their homes. We don't spend our tithes money on big mortgages or big salaries. Instead, we worship in homes and our elders are all bivocational. To read our Fundamentals of Fellowship or other information, visit our website at fellowshipofthefather.org. To visit us for Sunday worship or weekday breakfast and Bible study, give us a call at 678-570-2195. 1 Peter chapter 5 tells us, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. How do you measure the success of a shepherd of God's flock? Is it how much money he can generate through the flock to pay for big salaries and big buildings? Is it how many sheep he can pack into a building? Or is it something a lot harder to measure? the long-term health and maturity of the sheep. In recent years, there has been quite a bit of research on the actual condition of the sheep in God's flock in the United States. The Southern Baptist Council on the Family reported that 88% of children raised in Southern Baptist homes leave the church 
by the end of their freshman year of college. Research compiled by Dan Smithwick of Nehemiah Institute, the Barna Research Group, and the National Study of Youth and Religion show that American churches in the 21st century are utterly failing to pass along a biblical worldview to the next generation. They may be able to pack a building full of people on a Sunday morning, but is that the measure of success? There are rock stars who can pack a building full of people better than any pastor. But when both of them stand before God, that's not going to cause him to tell either one of them, well done, good and faithful servant. Churches may be able to generate a broad tithe base and have a huge monthly budget. But is that the measure of success? There are plenty of godless organizations promoting unbiblical agendas such as environmentalism, feminism, globalism, and a host of others that have budgets bigger than the largest churches. So how can a pastor measure his success? Is there a way for a pastor to know if he is truly building disciples of Christ? In Malachi, God makes some remarkable statements. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then, suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. If you want to be God's messenger who will prepare your people to receive the Lord and His multi-generational covenant, then you must be about the business of turning the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. In all of my studies concerning the covenants that God has made with men, I have yet to find a single covenant that was directed at that man alone. Rather, it was always to him and his descendants after him for the generations to come. Look at what God says about his covenant with Abraham. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Do you realize what God is saying here? He says, I chose Abraham because I knew that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And this is what will enable me to bring about for him what I promised him. If you want your ministry to have a multi-generational impact on your culture, then you need to be about the business of discipling your men to direct their children and their households to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then, suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to His temple and establish His multi-generational covenant with His people. This is never going to happen if you are satisfied with a church full of men who come to church on Sunday, listen to you preach, put some money in the offering plate, and believe they've done their Christian duty. The only way you will ever have a church full of men who successfully do the incredibly difficult job of directing their children and their households to keep the way of the Lord is for you to be building leaders. Your goal must be maturity. And if you're going to build mature, godly householders, you're going to have to go beyond simple Christian orthodoxy and move into Christian orthopraxy. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. 
Are the elementary teachings about Christ important? <laughs> Absolutely. They are the foundation upon which everything else must be built. But they're only the foundation. God's plan for a righteous man involves him building upon this foundation during each season of life to become a godly individual, a godly householder, a godly elder, and a godly statesman. God is calling men to leadership. And he revealed to us in his discussion about Abraham that spiritual leadership in the home is what will bring God's blessing upon every other area of a man's leadership. So how do you, as a shepherd of God's flock that is under your care, train your men to become godly householders? The first step for a man to become the spiritual leader of his home is for him to learn how to do daily family worship. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. One of the first skill sets of Christian orthopraxy, which you should be developing in your men, is how to establish and maintain the daily practice of family worship. Peter told us how to do this not lording it over those entrusted to your care, but being examples to the flock. The best way for your men to learn how to do daily family worship is for them to follow your example. As men begin thinking of themselves as spiritual leaders, they find themselves increasingly going against the popular culture. Family worship is truly a lost art in modern America. And it can be intimidating to a father to try to get his wife and his children excited about coming together every day for 30 minutes or an hour to do family worship. However, there is something that families routinely do together in our culture. They watch videos. The video medium is one of the most powerful tools for distance communication ever devised, engaging the senses in a number of ways. We have discovered that employing Bible teaching videos can help fathers make a smooth transition into daily family worship. This is one of the main reasons why we developed the E64 computerized curriculum to provide fathers with a simple but powerful and comprehensive tool for conducting family worship. So how can you, as a church elder, Follow through on the Apostle Peter's directive to lead by example. One easy and effective way to do this is to use the E64 software as a group. Choose a lesson plan that you believe will give your families the instruction they need. And then ask your men to follow your example of going through the lesson sections daily with their families. Lead a family Sunday school class or a family Bible study class every week where you go over the material studied during the week, allowing the men to share insights they have learned and to ask questions for group discussion. Another technique for generating excitement about family worship is conducting Bible competitions. E64 has a competition feature that selects questions at random from a lesson plan, creating a fun game that allows families to demonstrate what they have learned in their daily Bible studies. By scheduling regular competitions featuring specific chapters from the Bible, you can keep a high level of enthusiasm for studying the Bible together, particularly among the children. Our family does a Bible competition nearly every day with the contestants consisting of my wife and I and the nine children still living at home. The children look forward to it as the highlight of their day and study the Bible during their free time so they can do well in the competitions. The result has been that these children, some with severe special needs and who came from Soviet bloc orphanages, actually know more about the Bible than nearly any other children I know. 
In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. True success as a shepherd has nothing to do with big buildings, big crowds, and big budgets. The truly successful shepherd invests himself in the lives of a few men, helping them follow that narrow road that leads to becoming a godly elder. Let's watch some excerpts from one of the instructional films that come with the E64 software library, which you can purchase from the online store at e6-4.com. The people of Israel are called Jews. God gave the Jews His law, and He promised them that if they would obey it, they would live peacefully in the homeland He had provided for them. But the people did not obey, so God punished them. He sent an army to attack them. They broke down the walls of their city. They burned the city. Many of the people were killed, and those who lived were put in chains and forced to go live in a foreign land. After 70 years, God chose to give the people another chance to obey him. He caused the king to give them permission to return to their homeland. But when they got there, the city was burned, the walls were broken down, and it was a very sad and dangerous place. Nehemiah was a Jew who had a very important position. He was the cupbearer to the king. When he heard about the sad condition of his people in Israel, he spoke to the king about it. The king loved Nehemiah and gave him permission to go and help his people rebuild the walls of their city. This was a difficult and dangerous undertaking, and Nehemiah faced threats and opposition from his enemies. But because God helped them, the people finished rebuilding the wall in only 52 days. Let's help Nehemiah count down the days it will take to finish the wall. I will count backward from 52, and you count with me. 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Finished! The wall is finished. Now let's help Nehemiah count the blocks he needs to do the work. Each of these stacks are 10 blocks high. How many red blocks does he have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He has five red blocks. How many blue blocks does he have? One, two. He has two blue blocks. How many yellow blocks does he have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He has nine yellow blocks. 
Now let's learn about rows and columns. A row is a group of blocks all lined up beside one another, like this. A column is a group of blocks stacked on top of one another, like this. This wall has five rows of blocks. Row one, row two, row three, row four, and row five. This wall also has five columns of blocks. Column one, column two, column three, column four, and column five. Now let's look at top, bottom, left, right, and between. Top, bottom, left, right, and between. The top row of this wall is orange. The bottom row is green. The rows between the top and bottom are yellow. Top, bottom, between. What color is row one? Row one is orange. The column on the left of this wall is purple. The column on the right is red. The columns between the left and right are green. Left, right, between. What color is column one? Column one is purple. What is the number of the green column? The number of the green column is one. What is the number of the yellow column? The number of the yellow column is three. What color is the column on the right? The column on the right is purple. What color is the column on the left? The column on the left is green. What color is the column between the green and the yellow columns? The column between the green and the yellow columns is red. What color is the column between the yellow and the purple columns? The column between the yellow and the purple columns is blue. What is the number of the column between the red and the blue columns? The number of the column between the red and the blue columns is three. Let's look at this wall. What color is the top row? The top row is blue. What is the number of the bottom row? The number of the bottom row is five. What color is row three? Row three is red. What color is the row between the red and green rows? The row between the red and green rows is purple. What is the number of the row between the blue and red rows? The number of the row between the blue and red rows is two. Now it's time to do the question sets. Repeat these sets until you can quickly answer the questions correctly. Then take the final exam.